worship. Uh, we extend a very special welcome to the people who are worshiping with us online. We're so glad you're here with us today. Uh, we invite you, if you're worshiping online, to say hello in our chat room uh, so that we might uh, make a connection with you all. A bunch of announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, Marianne Crean is our organist this morning. Marianne, we're so glad to have you back with us this morning. Landry is out today, and he is, uh, I, I believe, on vacation. So uh, uh, we have other announcements. Uh, youth and parent meeting tonight at 6.30. So uh, for the youth group, if you're a parent of a youth, we invite you to be a part of that. Parents' Night Out is coming up on November 18th. Uh, there will be a congregational meeting on November 27th at 10.45. Uh, we're starting a new small group book study in November, and uh, we invite you to sign up for that. Uh, if you are online and in a different state, we're going to have some online groups, so you can certainly be a part of that as well. Uh, stewardship is ongoing. Uh, we're still receiving pledges, uh, so we hope you make your pledge for the year. We're also uh, passing out every member in ministry forms, and I hope everyone fills out an every member in ministry form. You can do that. Uh, uh, during the service at some point, uh, we, but please fill it out and leave it on a table in the, in, in the narthex as you, where you come in and leave. Finally, uh, Carols and Keyboards is coming up December 1st and 2nd, and we're still looking for some volunteers and uh, people who will help us to carry that off. So uh, we invite you to sign up for that. And I also need to issue a casting call for our live nativity. So it's going to be on December 18th from 2 to 4, and we are looking for angels, and I just look out there and see all angels, uh, but we're also looking for shepherds and for uh, wise men and women, and I see a lot of wise men and women as well. So uh, anyway, let me know if you can be a part of that. Uh, it was, really was a wonderful thing last year. Join me in the sentences of Scripture. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, you my trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Gracious God, we are grateful that through in every age there are people who have known you and have followed you and have shared your light with the world. May we here today also know you and to follow you in our worship and praise so that we might shine your light to the world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise in body and or in spirit and sing hymn number 620. <clears throat>
you may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and in faith, let us confess our sins to God, first in silence, followed by corporately by reciting the prayer of confession printed in your worship guide. Let us go to the Lord with our confession. And now, Lord, we join our voices. God of the prophets, we confess that we avoid facing the truth of our sinfulness so that we are not aware of the harm we cause or the good we could have done. But you, O oh Lord, know the truth about us. Forgive us for all we have done that hurts others and leads us in your way for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now may justice be with you. May mercy be with you. May compassion show through you. May love be with you. May God be with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Please extend one another peace. Peace of Christ.
Kat, thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. How great thou art, O Lord. How great thou art. And in this moment, I want to give great thanks to this choir assembly and their voices that just bring us even more towards your presence each and every week. And I lift up Kat today and Rita in, in just this moment, what they've brought to us spiritually. Oh Lord, we know your presence is among us and we give you great thanks. And as we read the word and teach the lessons, break open our hearts and minds to receive them so that we, we hear your voice and we are forever changed to go out and scatter in that world and be the hands and feet of the one who came to show us the truth and the way. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 I'd like to invite my young friends down. And yet again, I forgot my bag. I'll be right back. Always forgetting the props. Well, how are you this morning? Good? All right, let's see how we're going to do this. I think I might back up. Ann, can you sit right here in the front for me so we have like a circle? Will that work? Thank you. All right, and we're going to put that right here. And welcome to all our young friends at home. All right. All right, I need a favor. We are going to pass this tube of toothpaste around, and we are going to squeeze out all the toothpaste. All right? Now, I've been going around churches doing this example for oh, quite a while now. You haven't seen this before, have you? All right, well, it's a toothpaste trick. Now, we're going to try to do it fast, okay? So we have to get a good squeeze, pass it on. Good squeeze, pass it on. Good squeeze, pass it on, get it, all right, all right, till it's all gone, okay? All right, ready? All right, Ray, you gonna time them? You ready? All right, go. You're gonna need two hands. Keep going, come on up. You can get closer, get closer. Get closer, squeeze, 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 squeeze. That a boy, all right, keep going. Go, 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 Ian. Let's get close. Everybody get closer. There you go. Good one. Look at that. Nice. Ready? Come on. Come on. We're almost there. Your turn. Can you get that last little bit? You're going to squish it, squish it, squish it. Go, go, go. Oh, oh, are we done? No, there's a little bit. Oh, look at that, Blake. Good, strong arms. Good job. Good job. Good job. All right. Perfect. How long? All right, 59 seconds, not bad for my teamwork. That's pretty darn good, isn't it? All right, now we're gonna pass it around and I want you to put it back in. How? <laughs> you can't, huh? It would be really hard to put the toothpaste back in, wouldn't it, wouldn't it? Well, this reminds me of a scripture verse I wanna share with you today. It's, it's got a few words, the tongue of the wise adorns knowledge and truth, but the mouth of the fool <laughs> gushes folly. The mouth of the fool gushes folly. What that basically means, my friends, is that a wise person pours out kindness, love, forgiveness, and the truth from their mouth, and a fool does the opposite not nice things, nasty things, and tells lies. Does that make sense? So do we want to be, we want to be wise or fools? We want to be wise, and Jesus Christ helps us be wise. And just like we cannot get this toothpaste back into this tube, once we say something, we can never take it back. And that's why it's so important that we think before we, what? Speak. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to go downstairs and play another truth game. All right? Want to head out that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen and amen.
I, I did confirm and that uh, that she used Colgate. I figured it was Colgate because the smell of mint down here is very strong. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 a guy who worked very high, up high in Colgate, Palm Olive, once told me that Colgate is the largest purchaser of mint in the world. And it all goes into their toothpaste. Crest uses other, uh, other flavorings, but uh, Colgate uses uh, mint. Fun facts to know and tell. Which means to say that if you really wanted to, you could find out what your friend's toothpaste is, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, space is a good thing. Anyway, last week on the Elijah Chronicles, uh, the king of Aram, Ben Hadad, attacked the king of Israel, Ahab. And in the intervening time, uh, Ahab repulsed his attack. But in his mind, the job is unfinished, and so that brings us to our scripture for today. For three years, Aram and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah came to the king of Israel. Now, King Jehoshaphat, if you remember, David united the kingdoms. It was all one kingdom with David, and then Solomon, one kingdom, and then after Solomon kingdom split, Rehoboam, Jeroboam split the kingdoms, Jehoshaphat is the, is the king of the southern kingdom, uh, he rules from Jerusalem, and uh, Ahab is the king of Samaria. Interesting fact, in our lesson for today, he's never called Ahab, but Ahab is the king of, uh, of the northern kingdom, which is in Samaria, so there you go, two kingdoms. Okay, and then uh, Aram is further north in uh, in uh, present-day Jordan. The king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And yet we are doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. He said to Jehoshaphat, Go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. Basically what he's saying is we are one. We may be two, but we're one. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of them, and said to them, Shall I go battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom we may inquire? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one other by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlah. But I hate him. For he never prophesies anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Jehoshaphat said, Let the king not say such a thing. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Chineah, made for himself horns of iron, and said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. And all the prophets were prophesying the same, and saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives... Whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. When he come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. 
the Lord, but the king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each one go home in peace. You see what he's saying is that Ahab's not going to make it. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you? that he would not prophesy anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing beside him, to the right and to the left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Then one said one thing, and another said another, until a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. How? asked the Lord. He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do it. And so you see... The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these, your prophets. The Lord has decreed disaster upon you. Then Zedekiah, son of Chenaah, came up to Micaiah and slapped him on the face. And he said, which way did the spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? And Micaiah replied, you will find out on that day when you go in to hide in an inner chamber. The king of Israel then ordered, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him on reduced rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Hear you peoples, all of you. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us pray. Lord our God, may the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. My dissertation advisor was a man named Doug Otati, and he was one of the brightest people I've ever known. And I was once talking with a mutual friend of ours, Martin Cook, who's also one of the brightest people I've ever known. And they, they were friends, uh, they got to be friends when they did their doctoral studies at the University of Chicago. Martin taught at the Army and Naval War Colleges, and just, just incredibly bright. But I was saying to Martin, you know, Doug is one of the brighter people I've ever known. And uh, Martin said, yeah, I agree with you. I remember one night, let me tell you a story. I remember one night, uh, Doug and a bunch of friends went out and decided to party late. And the next day, we had a guest lecturer in our class. And the guest lecturer read his lecture in a monotone, using impenetrable philosophical terms and language and making vague references. And it, nobody could follow anything that he was saying and Doug sat in the back of the class with his eyes shut like this and everybody figured that Doug was catching up from last night and when the lecturer finished he turned to the class and said so do you have any questions and Martin said we didn't have any questions because we didn't understand a word he said we couldn't understand him at all and finally Doug spoke and it turned out he had not been sleeping. And Doug said, so what I think I hear you saying is that people generally start to think like the people they hang around with. And the lecturer said triumphantly, yes! Which didn't seem that difficult a point, really. 
Uh, to dress it up in language, we can make it really obscure. People generally start thinking like the people they hang around with. Not always, of course. Some people grow up and they say, I don't want to become my parents, or I don't want to be like these hypocrites. Uh, but generally, uh, philosophers and sociologists say that reality is socially constructed. And at its best, that means that reality exists independently of our perceptions, but our perceptions shape how we see reality. You may remember there was a, ho uh, a hoax. It was a paper published that said gravity was a social construction. Any of you remember that? It was pretty hilarious. Somebody wrote a paper saying gravity's the social, gravity's real. It's not socially constructed. But our perceptions of the world around us are shaped by the groups that we're part of. And just think of all the communities you're part of. You're part of a family. You're a, an American, probably. You are a Virginian. You may belong to a political party. You're part of a church. Uh, you're a citizen. You're part of the community of human beings that live after the Enlightenment. All of these things shape how you view things. And the fact that we perceive ourselves as a group and have a shared history and shared values and loyalties and interests, the fact that we share the same challenges and sometimes even share the same enemies shapes how we perceive the world. We're all in some group, and that's why once the talking points are shared and the hive mind is buzzing and the echo chamber is reverberating and the spin starts spinning, we begin to sort of see things like the people we hang out with. And I think this is a good thing. I mean, what kind of Christian would I be if I only, you know, if it was only me? I probably wouldn't be a Christian at all. You know, I've needed a community of people that existed through the ages that walked with Jesus and remembered these things and wrote the Bible and a community of people who kept the traditions alive, a community of people that called me to follow Jesus, a community of people who modeled what faithful discipleship looked like and how beautiful servanthood is and, and generosity and all of these things. I needed people to inspire me. I've also needed people to challenge me, to correct me, to call me out, and make me uncomfortable, which is to say, I've needed prophets. Groupthink is unavoidable, and it can be a good thing, but I think our story tells us and shows us its limits. The king of Judah and the king of Israel are plotting to attack Aram and take back the city of Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat says, before we rush into this, we should inquire what the prophets say. And so they inquire of the prophets, and 400, which is a fair number of prophets, 400 of them say, attack, the Lord will give you victory. One prophet, Zedekiah, even goes so far as to fashion some iron horns and says, with these you will gore the Arameans. And I have no idea how he did that, if the horns were like he put on his head and he ran around looking ridiculous, or uh, if he carried the horns out and you're going to gore them. I mean, I, I don't know how he did it. But he fashioned iron horns. Remember, iron is a kind of a new technology, much stronger than bronze. Everybody's on board. And yet somehow Jehoshaphat isn't persuaded yet. And you have to wonder why. Was it because everybody was like, let's do this? Uh, for whatever reason, Jehoshaphat says... Isn't there another prophet that we can ask? And Ahab says, well, there's Micaiah, but he never says anything nice about me. And so the messengers go get Micaiah, and they bring him, and on the way they say, listen, everybody's on board with this, tell them that we need to attack. That's how social coercion works, right? We're all on board, don't rock the boat. Often it's not quite that obvious. So Micaiah goes along with it. He tells Ahab what he wants to hear. He says, uh, you know, attack. The Lord's going to deliver you a victory. Uh, and when I was reading this, I was like, why does Micaiah go along with this? I mean, is it the social pressure, the hive mind? It doesn't really seem like Micaiah, especially later on. Does he, how does King Ahab know that he's not getting the straight story from him? 
Is it the way he said it? Did he say it with such sarcasm? It's like, you brought me here to agree with you, so I, I agree. Go ahead. I mean, you happy? I mean, how did, how did Ahab pick up? For whatever reason, Ahab realizes that Micaiah is not playing straight with him and demands the truth. So Micaiah tells him, it's going to be a disaster. And Ahab's response is dismissive. He turns to Jehoshaphat and says, see? I told you, this guy never says anything good about me. Then Micaiah says something really strange. He tells him that he had a vision. The Lord wants to defeat Ahab. And so he sends a spirit to deceive the prophets in order to lead Ahab into a trap. Now, this story raises a lot of interesting questions about God's theodicy, justice, God's justice that we're not going to answer today. I spent a day trying to write a sermon, this sermon, and uh, I've got all my notes. There's a lot of very interesting things we could say about this. But uh, given the mystery of God's ways, God's ways lie beyond our minds. But this story does explain why Micaiah didn't tell Ahab the truth. Because Micah, Micaiah's in on it. He's part of the plan, the plot to deceive Ahab and destroy him. Now this story, of course, indicts all the other prophets. They're lying because they're channeling a lying spirit. And this so offends Zedekiah, it provokes him to come up and give Micaiah a slap on the face. And Ahab has Micaiah locked up and puts him on a reduced ration of bread and water. It's quite a story, actually. And the question I have is, where do you see yourself in this story? It's always a good question to ask uh, whenever we're reading stories in the Bible. Where do you see yourself? Ahab, are you Ahab? Are you Jehoshaphat? Are you Micaiah? I hope that we can recognize that we can all be like Ahab. You know, there are some truths that we don't like hearing because they're hard and they're difficult. And there's such a thing as confirmation bias, and, and we keep the prophets who will tell us what we want to hear close at hand, and people like Micaiah who tell us maybe what we need to hear, we keep them at a distance, and whenever they say anything that's, that we don't like, we say, well, what do you expect? You know, I recognize a little of Ahab in myself. But I hope that we'll all be like Jehoshaphat, we understand that it's not just about doing what we want. We need to inquire about the truth of things. We need to seek the prophets. And that just because someone is a prophet doesn't mean that they're speaking the truth. And just because you've got 400 of them all saying the same thing doesn't mean that they're telling you the, the truth either. Jehoshaphat, throughout this whole story, exercises quite a bit of critical thinking. And he probes deeper. And finally, I hope we can all be like Micaiah able and willing to tell painful truths. Truth and love is what Ephesians says. Even when nobody wants to hear, even if we're the only one, even if telling the truth means sacrifice. In a lot of places around the world, telling the truth means a lot of sacrifice. But I also hope that we can be like Micaiah in another way. Micaiah understands that he can't prove the truth. And Zedekiah comes at him, and later, twice in our story, Micaiah says, you're going to see. The future's going to show you. Uh, he trusts that the future will prove what's true. And it always does. And I think this gives him confidence to endure what, what must have been a pretty unhappy fate, being locked up and put on bread and water. As Christians, we have something else that helps us to know and tell the truth and to grow deeper into the truth. As we know about grace. Do you know about grace? Knowing and speaking the truth is not a work that makes us right with God. It isn't. 
It is not a work that makes us right with God. We are not justified by our right theology. Nobody's justified because they're correct. We are justified by grace as a gift from God. And this means that we don't have to justify ourselves. And this is good news because attempts to justify ourselves or to justify our ideas, which sometimes we get so locked into, we are so identified with, often leads us to defend the indefensible and drives us deeper into error. We also know about grace because grace not only justifies us, it sanctifies us. It leads us forward into new ways of thinking and understanding. You know, I think about when I first became a Christian in college, when it all kind of clicked for me, and, 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 and I, like, got it. Um, I remember those first Easter's when it was like the resurrection Christ is risen this is amazing and I still think that but I am also very glad that I do not still think like I thought when I was 18 and 19 I'm glad that I've been able to grow and change and I feel like God's been a part of that growth leading me deeper into the truth of scripture the truth of God's love the truth of God's grace because what I've learned is that God's grace towards me is greater than I ever imagined it needed to be. And I've also discovered that God's grace towards others is greater than I can ever imagine either. Because grace sanctifies us and will lead us further into the truth, we can hold our current opinions somewhat lightly, even as we hold tight to the grace that holds us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we trust that you hold the future and that you hold us and that there will be a day when all is known and we will know even as we are fully known. Lord, in the meantime, lead us into your truth. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise in body and or in spirit and sing hymn number 450. <laughs>
Let us confess uh, what we believe using a portion of the brief statement of faith. Christians, what do you believe? We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the good. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the death of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, and delivering us from death to life eternal. Uh, Amen. The prayer I'm about to share with you was written by, or we are going to share together, was written by Bruce Pruer. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we first pray for the world wor- worldwide church. By the inflowing of the Holy Spirit, may we become in practice more truly what we already are in faith and hope, the body of Jesus Christ and the new family of God. Let there be truth, healing, compassion, and joy, God of our salvation. Now let us pray for our country and the world that the values of the kingdom of God may become less unusual in the way we care for the weak and the neglected, the foolish and the disgraced. Let there be truth, healing, compassion, and joy, O God of our salvation. Let us pray for the strong and the wealthy, the powerful and the ruthless, the famous and the idolized, that they may realize how easy it is to gain the whole world, yet lose your way of grace. Let there be truth, healing, compassion, and joy. O God of our salvation. And O Lord, we pray for ourselves, that we open up ourselves creatively through the power of your Spirit to be forever changed by your gift of grace. Let there be truth, healing, compassion, and joy, O God of our salvation. And now let us pray together for all who are suffering, broken, and forlorn people around us in church and community. That healing, that the healing of your son Christ may reach into the soul's depths where no human hand can touch or human word can console. Ah but let there be truth, healing, compassion, and joy, O God of our salvation. And now unto you, O loving and gracious God, who is always doing far better than we can think or pray or do, may the glory in your church through Jesus Christ be known. And now we join our voices together, praying the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now let us present our tithes and God's offerings. Before I sing, sing a solo today, actually it's not a solo, it's a duet with my granddaughter, Emily. But before I sing it, this little story goes behind it. Uh, a couple months ago, the Roberts and the Cottons were having dinner together and we got to talking about, uh, actually, I got to talking about how much I enjoyed the choir, the, you know, what a good job they were doing. And that led to talking about Ray's sermons at the time, which if you recall, uh, had to do with, with the fact that Christ was always there for us. And I said, Ray, you know, with all the chaos we have, with the, with the fear and the turmoil and, and the highest inflation we've seen in 70 years and war in Ukraine and so on, I said, it's nice to come to church and hear a sermon and walk home remembering that we can always touch Jesus. And at that point, some, not for some reason, I said, you know, I'd like to come out of retirement after seven years and sing a solo for the congregation. And this solo <coughs> was, and of course I asked Ray, I said it would be with your permission and Landry's permission as well, but uh, I said this solo, which he's familiar with, was composed by Dr. Thomas A. Dorsey. Not the Tom Dorsey that Nancy and I and a couple of the others in the congregation here may have danced to back in 1950. Dr. Thomas Dorsey, who was a famous Afro-American composer, considered the father of gospel, by the way, he composed some 3,000 numbers. Dr. Dorsey had been engaged to uh, conduct this massive chorus. He was more famous, actually, for, for conducting choruses of 100 or 150 people. And he had been engaged to conduct the chorus for a denomination in St. Louis uh, and had accepted it and so on. But the moment as, as it came time to go, he decided he didn't want to go because his wife had become pregnant. She was going to deliver two weeks after the, after the uh, uh, program, and he just didn't want to go. And she said, Thomas, the doctor says, I'm in great health. There's nothing wrong. The baby, I'm carrying the baby well. You're only going to be gone two nights. You're only 100 miles away. There's no reason not to go. So speaking just to the men in the audience for a moment here. I have found after 60 years that if your wife wants you to do something, there's only two words you can say. Yes, dear. <laughs> Dr. Dorsey went to the St. Louis. The first morning he had this huge chorus, over 100 people, was conducting them. They'd been about in the rehearsal about an hour when the back door of the auditorium opened. A man came walking down. No one knew him. He was holding a yellow piece of paper. Walked up on the stage, handed a telegram to Dr. Dor Dorsey, which said, your wife was taken as to an emergency birth this morning. We regret to inform you that she passed away. Well, of course, he arranged immediately for a new conductor, hurried home. In those days, they didn't have freeways in Illinois. Uh, this, is, this is, remember, back in 1940s. And arrived home four hours later. His family greeted him and saying, Thomas, the baby died also. He went into depression, wouldn't talk to anyone, didn't want to eat. Finally, a couple weeks later, his good friend, who was also an organist and a musician, came by, persuaded him they should go down to their church hall and have a cup of coffee, which they did. And as the story goes, they'd been sitting there for perhaps five minutes when Dr. Dorsey got up, walked over to the piano, started to play an old famous old hymn, 
I think it was how firm a foundation, but I forget at the moment. In any event, after a couple times through, he played a couple riffs and all of a sudden was composing a new hymn. And after 15 minutes, he had the music done. And after another five or 10 minutes, he had the words done. I hope you enjoy Emily and I singing, Precious Lord, take my hand. But there's just one more thing. His friend sitting there came over and said, Thomas, this is a wonderful hymn, but you must change the first word. It should not be blessed, Lord. It should be precious, Lord. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me home through the night, through the storms, through the dark, to thy light. I have dreamed a great dream that thy love will rule the land. Precious Lord, precious Lord, take my hand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Gracious God, we are grateful for all your gifts. The gift of this community, the gift of faithful witnesses in this church, 
the gift of music, the gift of faith through time, the gift of song. For all your gifts that you give us in Jesus Christ, which are too numerous to, to count, and all the gifts you give us in creation, which bless our lives and make our lives even possible. Lord, we ask that you would take these gifts that we return to you so that others might know truly how much we are blessed. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us rise in body and or in spirit and sing hymn number 307. <laughs> Now may the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those only God can love, wherever they may be, this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>